Uh, hi, Tara. Thank you so much for joining us and speaking with the Workers' Party of Britain today. Um, we're really excited to hear uh, your analysis and views on what's currently going on in Ukraine. Um, a little bit for our audience who may not know who you are. Uh, you're an author, poet, actor and activist and uh, currently you're hosting a podcast on RT and, um, and write op-eds for RT. Uh, but you've also previously worked uh, for US Congressman as well as former uh, Senator, now President Joseph Biden. Um, so I think you, you know, you have a lot of uh, insight which you can uh, help us uh, with today. Um, I really want to start with um, what's currently happening in Ukraine. I know you've written a, an op-ed, um, was it today or, or yesterday that that's been released? Um, yeah, I had written um, an op-ed last week, last about, week. Um, just sort of about media and yes. how they villainize and call people Russian agents and things like that. Yeah. Um, we'll get into that very soon. Um, but I wanted to talk about yeah the situation in Ukraine. If you could just give a, a sort of uh, overview uh, to those of us who may not have been able to sort of keep up with this, you know, constantly uh, changing and developing situation. Just you know, uh, from 2014 to now, like how we've gotten into this uh, situation where Putin is now um, recognizing independent regions of Donetsk and, and Luhansk, where NATO are rushing to implement sanctions against uh, Russian individuals. Uh, how have we gotten here? Well, you know, I, I can, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And, um, you know, your party leader, George Galloway, I have so much immense respect for his knowledge of history and political, um, you know, the geopolitical scene. And, uh, you know, so I'm really pleased to be here. So thank you and to all of you. Um, first of all, I want to I want to kind of go back and how I kind of came forward yeah, sure. um, with I came forward about Joe Biden. Um, at the time I came forward, he was gonna drop out of the presidential race and then he didn't. And I came forward about the fact that I was a Senate aide and I was um, sexually assaulted by him. I went through protocol, made complaints. Those are sealed um, about the sexual harassment. Um, as far as the sexual assault, I did make a police report. There's been no investigation into Joe Biden. Where I'm at now, after the media just sort of used, he used resources and paid money, according to FEC, to go after me, um, about 2.2 million, and also suppress the Hunter Biden story, which we'll talk about later. Um, and how that affected me was I had huge corporate Western media coming after me, like the New York Times, Washington Post, AP, basically, and then using their you know, their social media also to, to try to silence me and discredit me, villainize me, call me a Russian agent right out the gate. That's what I was labeled. Um, because my views are different than some of the talking points that we are supposed to be given by our Western government. So, so here we are in this geopolitical mess and I've been quite loud about my feelings about not wanting war with Russia. Um, and I think many citizens in America feel like that. I don't think NATO is, is united and wanting it. Um, it's obvious that France and Germany are not, although Germany is kind of getting pulled by the US like a vassal state. But um, basically, how is this war going to help the workers of the United States or Great Britain or anywhere in the world? It's going to harm them. So. In 2014, some of the people that I knew back in the day are still kind of milling around through the government jobs. Um, and 2014, you had Madon, you had us basically fund and support a coup that also included neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Um, and we put in basically what some people determine as a puppet, you know, kind of propped up a puppet government. The United States keeps asserting Ukraine is a democracy. It is not a democracy, you know? And, um, you know, just as evidence of that, I think some journalists who have investigated this, like Aaron Mate or Brian McDonald or some of those have talked about how four of the media outlets were shut down. So people aren't, you know, in, in Ukraine. Um, opposition leadership is either jailed or have had to flee. So they are not an example of democracy. So that that's like kind of the big um, bellowing call from Great Britain and US to get into this war to protect democracy that you're hearing. So what I, what I will contend 
is that this is because the US and Britain's domestic policies under their current governments are failing. And I can speak directly to the US. We have um, the highest inflation that we've had in 40 years and it's growing into maybe a super inflation. So you see prices that are unbelievable that are going up and up. You have a living wage that is stagnant. We have over a half a million people unhoused, so homeless. That's why you're seeing city streets in America with people sleeping on the streets and children. Over 25% of our children are in the poverty line or under. And by poverty, I mean in some cases where there's no electricity and no running water. And this is the America that you're not seeing from the elites. So the Democrats and Republicans who are the main two parties in America are actually to me, two snake heads on the same, you know what I mean? Two heads on the same snake. They are answering to the American oligarchs, to the oil and gas industry that of course wanted to shut down Nord Stream 2, right? And that's just happening. And as today, as a matter of fact, and they also want to fund the military industrial complex because you've got Raytheon, companies like that. And all of this involves Britain as well, because American and, and um, Britain are in the same boat where that both economies are having a lot of difficulties for workers. So instead of handling the domestic crisis, they're um, putting their energy and focus and money and their PR weaponizing Western media to create an enemy that doesn't want to be our enemy, you know, and you have Russia five times to Sunday saying we don't want war. You have the Ukrainian president saying they're losing money every month, like in the billions, and they don't think that Russia is going to invade. You have President Putin, who has now said more than once in the last two weeks, he does not want war. Yeah. All we have to do is listen. I mean, they're, I, I don't know what size the US military is at the moment, but do they even have the capacity to sort of call on the kind of troops that would be needed uh, to sort of engage in a full scale war? I, I don't think there's been any talk of that happening yet, but uh, you never know well, how these things are the going rhetoric, to happen. The rhetoric that they're giving right now in America, I don't know how it is for Great Britain, is that they will not put soldiers, um, so it's kind of a double speak. They say they will not, um, put soldiers in Ukraine. However, they're funding what's called lethal aid, which is a horrible term, actually. It's, 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 it's really draconian when you think about it. Um, but we just passed two weeks, two, three weeks ago, $787 billion towards a military budget. And we're asking for an additional 38 million, I believe, and there may be more now, because um, I think more has happened in those last three weeks to fund specifically Ukraine um, with, with weapons. And of course you have ops, special ops that go in and train. And then um, the, you know, the president of the United States said in his speech last week, he said, we have intelligence on the ground in Ukraine. Translation, when the US says that, look for a coup, look for you know false flags, look for things that have happened in Central and South America and other nations. I mean, they, they said that they were expecting Russia to uh, conduct a false flag uh, operation, which basically to me says that the US are planning a false flag uh, operation that they can then blame on Russia. Right. And I think that, you know, again, for the average US citizen or maybe British citizen, we're worried about paying our rent, um, pay, trying to get medical you know, help, trying to make sure our children are in school and housed and clothed and having a roof over our heads, literally, and food on our table. And these elites are taking us into um, a war that's gonna end up losing thousands of lives, Ukrainian, Russian, American, and British, among other NATO nations, if we continue down this path. Yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I don't remember how we came to World War Three. Like, no one wants that, no one. Yeah. No. I guess it's just like the lo the logic of their imperial system is like they need to keep expanding, they need to keep growing, and they haven't really been able to do that. Um, and I guess especially in the US, similar in Britain, but with inflation, with wage sort of stagnation, um, increasing cost of living, people don't have um, the money to like spend on anything anymore. So, uh, you know, consumer um, consumerism is sort of 
drying up they need to like look elsewhere to try and increase their profits and and one way to do that is through war and destruction and accumulation and yeah well there was a film called wag the dog years and years ago and i um i haven't even watched it recently but um but it basically it was on the concept that you just keep you keep um everyone's attention on trying to make a war but you're making a war that will happen because you're making it happen so to speak but <laughs> Like there's no dog left to wag. Like we're at a place where Russia does not want to be our enemy. Ukraine doesn't want to be the killing fields and Europe doesn't want to be. And the U.S. is pushing it hard. And unfortunately, Britain is going right along with that because you have um, right now your own domestic issues that are, you know, pushing um, some sort of distraction to keep away from what's happening. I mean, the the US and the UK would be quite silly to engage in some kind of full on conflict because, you know, Russia's obviously uh, nuclear armed and a massive army, I think, bigger than probably the UK and maybe the US combined. You know, they're not, it's not Afghanistan, which I mean, <laughs> NATO troops didn't do so well there either, but it's not, you know, going to be some kind of pushover. Is it, do they just want the appearance of, of tension and the, the appearance of a conflict that they can then roll back and say, you know, oh, we, we came to a diplomatic solution when, you know, that was the, the plan. Mm -hmm. or, or they say, oh, we got Vladimir Putin to blink. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, the rotating villain. Okay. Like, you know, we've had so many, right. You know, going back with some of our, the way we've entered into other people's countries without their permission, like Libya, like Iraq, Iran, Syria. I mean, I could go down the list. There's literally <laughs> hundreds. Oh, even my own country, Australia, was um, our prime minister was overthrown by a, a CIA-backed uh, coup. <laughs> and now uh, we're the greatest of allies. <laughs> and Bolivia went through what it just went through, um, you know. And, uh, you know, so you have... You have a lot of economic interest and um, in Russia not becoming a world economic power. And what I can tell you is that as a staffer, and I was a low level staffer at first, remember, but they tend to talk in front of you because, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I heard with my own ears, and this was after the Soviet Union collapse, I heard with my own ears, they said people talking in those rooms talking about not wanting Russia to have, um, to rise economically again. And what, the reason why Vladimir Putin is such an enemy is because of his 2007 speech, probably his speech yesterday, and, and because he actually created a middle class in Russia and he kicked out some of the oligarchs that were stealing. I'm not saying it's perfect. I haven't lived there. I don't know, you know, and it's not my, that's not my purview. What I'm trying to say is that we're creating a villain because it fits our, the American narrative to create an enemy that we can justify 787 billion instead of spending it on our own citizens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I traveled to Russia maybe uh, five years ago and uh, everyone I spoke to there absolutely loved uh, President Putin because, you know, they um, they felt very economically secure. Their, um, their cost of living was low relative to their income and they felt, you know, hopeful about the future and that their country was, you know, becoming more prosperous. And, um, you know, there's definitely not this kind of attitude towards Putin that the, our media kind of wants us to, to believe that there is. Um, which sort of leads me to the next question about, you know, you, you're a journalist for the RT. Do you have any insight into how Russian, uh, the Russian working people are sort of perceiving this, uh, this political crisis? Um, what I would say to that is I'm not, I don't consider myself a journalist. I'm a writer. I've, I've been an author. Um, you know, I'm, I have a law degree and I'm trained and, but for, for real journalists, I think you need to look at Matt Taibbi, Aaron Mate, Brian McDonald, who is an expert and Brian lives there and he's an Irish journalist that lives there. But I really think that they can give a better perspective than I can on that question. But what I can say is I do have Russian friends and that I speak to that live in Moscow and also one that comes has dual citizenship and you know so in my limited little group i guess yep. um you can say i can say that they are mystified by the aggression and russophobia and you know i have a cousin that's russian and i i have my own feelings about how much that bigotry is is emotionally harmful as well as just it's just ridiculous and ignorant and you know um 
when I spoke positively about Russia in general or Vladimir Putin, I mean, you've seen me just get, you know, attacked. <laughs> yeah. called a yeah. traitor. You're a, you're a Russian spy and you're a, yeah, stooge. Uh, and, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it wasn't just like social media. It was yeah. actual journalists calling me that. Um, actual people with huge platforms, celebrities and people with power accusing me of being a traitor, including when I came forward, Joe Biden's campaign to the New York Times, they asserted that they kept sending my comments about Vladimir Putin and about um, Russia, because I was writing a novel during that time. And um, they kept using it as an example of why, you know, and, you know, implying. So I would get calls from, and I mean, you have to understand these are lead New York Times reporters asking me if I had an online Russian boyfriend and said they had it verified under two sources. Well, I'm still waiting. You know, yeah. I don't know. It must have stood me up. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I even yeah. said to her, and I got a little salty. And I said, you're the New York Times. This isn't a tabloid. What are you doing? But it was, it was a way to shut down yeah. the truth of what I was saying, which was I came forward, went through protocol about a U.S. senator that sexually assaulted me. They didn't want to talk about that. They wanted to talk about Russia. So it's just a bait and switch. And I'm guessing that, um, I mean, I'm really sorry that that happened to you, by the way, and that you've been treated this way. I can imagine that these journalists probably consider themselves like liberals and that they were like, believe women who come forward with these kinds of allegations. But when it threatens, you know, their person, their person in power, then, you know, all hell breaks loose, really. And the principle, the principle sort of goes out the window. Um, it does, you know, like the Me Too movement, which has now become sort of a, you know, it's a, it's a communication tool, you know, as uh, I think Rosa McGowan put that eloquently, um, and then sort of a hashtag. And luckily, like when you say Me Too, you know what it means is what she's yeah. saying. Yeah. But it, they sure weren't there for me, you know. I came forward with eight other women and um, I was just singled out, you know, you'll notice like with sexual assault kind of cases, um, they used the same way to villainize, except they threw in the Russian agent. That was the that was the one I didn't expect. But the yeah. rest of it, I did they? What I was wearing, um, was I a honey trap? All these ridiculous claims, and um, you know, it, it it just, but it definitely got the conversation going. In, and they class shamed me as well. I was a yeah. single mom putting myself through law school. They made fun of the fact I couldn't afford my law books. I'm not ashamed of poverty. I came up through a lot of barriers. If anything, I'm trying to demonstrate resilience and that you can educate your family and yourself and you can come through obstacles. But instead of kind of framing it that way, they decided to attack me as if I were, well, they try to make it sound like I was trash basically or not relevant. Yeah, because you're from a different sort of circle than what they are pretty much because all these yeah. journalists tend to run in the same circles and be educated at the same institutions. And, uh. Oh, yeah, all their, you know, elite schools and whatever. And, you know, I, I actually went to a Jesuit. I mean, it was Seattle University School of Law, you know, because I have a Catholic background and um, yeah, I'm not really I'm not practicing, but um, as much. But um, so I'm not a good Catholic. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that I came from you know, this background that um, would have allowed me to probably enter into some of those circles, but I chose not to, you know, I chose a different path. And I also chose to not, you know, go with Joe Biden. So, and that particular day. Yeah. That's really the main, the main point of contention, I think for them, isn't it? Yeah. Um, on to, on to Biden now. Um, I mean, there's a, there's been talk of, you know, his son's like murky sort of connections with um, Ukrainian companies. Um, I don't think there's ever been a really like proper examination into these things by the mainstream press. It seems to get shut down um, about the connections. And there was a lot of um, mockery of Donald Trump for bringing up, you know, Hunter Biden's laptop and all of these things. Um, do you think that Biden's motivations for like uh, pushing on the Ukraine issue now has anything to do with with these uh, personal sort of connections with the country or is it more just a, a American ruling class program, you know, overall? Well, you, you've asked a really good question because this is this goes to corruption. 
Okay. And this goes to the heart of the matter, economic. What I believe is that there should be an investigation into Joe Biden for his economic ties and his family ties to Ukraine. What I believe is there should be an investigation into his sexual assault allegations and the other seven women. I think more would come forward in a safe venue. There could be, it would take one member of, of the United States Senate or Congress to call for an investigation. Will there be one? I don't know. Um, I do know that the corruption among the Democratic elites has been well publicized in, you know, England as well as the U.S. You're talking about um, Cuomo, you know, the former governor of New York. You're talking about Joe Biden. You're talking about Nancy Pelosi, who's been doing insider trading and um, was very, you know, kind of sharp when people suggested that that not happen. I think um, they don't even, I mean... Someone was saying that there's a lot of corruption in Ukraine, right, all the way down to like, you know, having to deal with bribery. The U.S. doesn't need to 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 do that because it's state sanctioned yeah. basic theft from the yeah. working class. Yeah. And um, so the corruption is so deep. You see it with the pharmaceutical companies and our political figures like Biden. I worked for Biden, so I know he stacked his upper staff with um, with DuPont former employees, DuPont Corporation, and with, he worked for Delaware, which was um, represented the, which is our major credit card companies that you see all over Citibank. And they have the lowest like ta corporate tax rate in Delaware, isn't it? They, yeah, a lot of companies set it's, up their base there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as long as you have all of this economic ties to the military industrial complex where you have like Raytheon and you have like Lockheed Martin and some of the manufacturers and in these inter multi-international companies and, you know, BP with fuel. And, and as long as you have these politicians that are, you know, having to be their echo box, their echo chamber, you know, the working people are lost. I mean, we have to stand up and really bring people into office that are not tied to corporate interests. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of people were so hopeful with like Bernie Sanders and even um, AOC, but they all just seem to be, uh, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing, really. Um, I mean, I saw a tweet from Bernie Sanders uh, basically saying that, you know, Russia was the aggressor and that Russia need to ease off. And I mean, there's just, there's just no one really that seems trustworthy that the working class can vote for. Um, you know, to change anything in Congress, it really has to be, you know, from the from the bottom up. I mean, is there any sort of movement building um, in the US at the moment? I mean, for the third party, this is what happens with the third, when they have try to have third or fourth parties, um, the, the people, the groups like Justice Democrats will try to infiltrate and they'll sow division. So what you're seeing, I don't know if you've noticed, but the, the social media discourse that you see isn't just discourse. There's an actual, uh, there's an actual means to an end where they're trying to divide the, the, the left, so to speak. Um, and the left being the working class or wanting progressive views, right? Um, and they wanna go moderate. Well, the moderates are the elites. They don't, I mean, and frankly, it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat in the United States. And I don't know how it is in England, but here, I mean, they're just there. It's the same policies, basically, just with different outfits on. That's yeah, it. No, we 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 say the same. Uh, we have the Tories and the Labour Party, and we say they're two sides of the same coin or two cheeks of the same ass. Um, you know, <laughs> the Tories stab you in the front, and the Labour Party stabs you in the back, maybe while holding a rainbow flag. Um, that's about the only difference. <laughs> well, and you said wolf in sheep's clothing, yeah. and that's really telling, right? That's that's kind of what I experienced actually. You know, coming up, I thought Joe Biden was this champion of women's rights. He funded the, the Violence Against Women Act, which is a very big act in the United States that protects women in domestic violence and abuse situations well of course he signed that because he's an abuser right I didn't yeah. know I mean like I respected him for that and so for me there was a lot of because I was part of that you know system I was working in it there was a lot of cognitive dissonance what was happening to me and then what they were presenting yeah. so like you said wolf in sheep's clothing um and one thing that I found quite uh remarkable, I guess, over the last sort of, 
well, really since Trump was elected in, in 2016, is he's the only American president uh, that I can remember that hasn't gotten uh, the US into a war, into a new war. Um, but, you know, he was seen as the most uh, right wing, like even called a fascist by the, the liberal media in the US. Um, and he sort of started off this wave of like accusations of um, Russian influence, Russian infiltration into the US uh, Congress, into, into Trump's presidency. Um, and I can only imagine that the Russophobia at the moment is like reaching a fever pitch. But the funny thing is like Fox News and I think Tucker Carlson in particular seem to be the only uh, channel or the only pundit that's, you know, against uh, this sort of war and against this, this movement to label everything as, you know, being a Russian plot. Can you talk a bit about that? Absolutely. I mean, you know, what you're talking about is a tactic. And, I, and you know, as, as someone who worked in politics as an operative, I know what the, I know what they're doing. It's it, you want to distract the conversation to a to a fear based reality that people can latch onto. That's simple. That you can have sound bites. You can have social media hashtags, whatever, and make an enemy. Enemy, and and you don't want to be the enemy, and you don't want to bring it too close, right? As far as Russophobia goes, I would say it goes back further. It goes back. Right around, you know, remember Ukraine, we'll go back to Ukraine again. We've been done with Victoria Newland with her involvement. It goes back and to the Cold War. <laughs> anyway, but, yeah. but especially just recently, the exposure that Julian Assange gave of governmental crimes and the emails, and those weren't just emails, those were giving the general public just how many war crimes were being committed without our consent. Um, what the real strategies were behind the scenes. And that's why Victoria Newlands became quite well known. And that's why Julian Assange sits in, in you know, Belmarsh because he spoke truth to power. He was, ex he was letting the world know. That's why Edward Snowden isn't able to come home to the United States because he you know, exposed the government surveillancing its own citizens. And then Daniel Hale exposed um, drone, how it was 90% civilians. And then we just saw it again with Afghanistan. And um, so going back to that, they needed a narrative, right? And so the narrative became Russia's bad, America's good, Europe is good, Russia's bad. And then that's it. It was that simple. And you build on that. So it was neo-McCarthyism, in my opinion. Yeah. And Hillary Clinton took that and ran at a full sprint because she lost her election um, by her own accord, not because of any meddling. And um, she didn't go to Wisconsin. She didn't do certain things she needed to do to win and get support. Yeah. And um, so you have this narrative build and build and build. Then you had people like her in her position call out Tulsi Gabbard who is a veteran and, or actually she's in the National Guard right now, a former Congresswoman and called her a Russian asset. I mean, how Jill Stein, Green yeah. Party, you yeah. were asking about third parties. They, yeah. they kind of deplatform Green parties. They called Jill Stein a Russian asset because she sat next to, you know, Vladimir Putin at a diplomatic function. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm I mean, sure Hillary Clinton has met Vladimir Putin. So does that mean that she's also a Russian agent? Yeah. Right, right. And Tucker Carlson, what he's doing is he he's like, look, we're hearing all these voices. He wanted to interview Putin. His crime, his, they're actually calling him out some blue checks, I call them. Some of the, some of, um, and some were actually in the United States Senate. I think there was one senator wants to investigate him for sedition, which is very serious. Yes. Because but he wanted to interview Putin. Yeah, like everybody wants to interview Putin yeah. on the West because we never get to hear from him directly yeah. Yeah. without filters and being told what we're supposed to think. So, I guess, you know, the idea of, of Putin being heard on like a primetime American TV show is just too dangerous um, to, to the American sort of political establishment. Well, uh, maybe Kelly did a, an interview with him that was lengthy, but you know, the best one I've seen is Oliver Stone's documentary. If you can get it, I don't know if you can get it in Great Britain on Showtime or whatever, you can get it, you can get it on Prime. But, you know, Oliver Stone did it over a period of months. It was very, and you know, some of the same things President Putin was saying then, he, he just said yesterday. Yeah. Um, 
And I know today Joe Biden just gave a speech where he said he gave some rhetoric about how Vladimir Putin just can't create countries. And again, he's simplifying it down so that Americans will be just like, oh, this is outrageous. But if they go and listen and look at the transcript that's translated into English of his speech, that's not what he's saying at all. He's recognizing independent states that are in pain. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, can, I can't imagine like what it's like, uh, you know, turning on the TV or opening up a newspaper in the US at the moment. I mean, what, what, are, what are Americans in general thinking, you know, the American working class, I can't imagine that they want to get involved in another war, but do they, do they believe all of this stuff that they hear about Russia or, you know, are they, are they skeptical? It's a mixed bag. And, you know, unfortunately, um, there's some echo chambers on, you know, social media, right, where we kind of like hear what we need to hear or want to hear. But when you're outside the echo chambers with the working people, they they don't understand it. They don't know. OK, we're going to get into another war. We just got out of Afghanistan. That was a mess for 20 years and costs how much. And yeah. now we're going to go to this. Like yeah. people are just questioning it. I think I think now people are like, wait a second, I, I'm you're going to ask me to go die for some other, yeah. No, I don't think yeah. they're buying. I think yeah. they know, you know, we're coming up on November and the midterms in the United States in the fall. It will determine the House and the Senate. You know, and so the Democrats, a lot of the people in Congress are afraid they're gonna lose their seats. And unfortunately they think war is the profitable way and to get the ratings up. It's really ugly and it's basic and it's horrible. Is it because- um... Yeah, go ahead. Is it, sorry, I was going to say, you know, have they just become so unpopular after like the last two years of COVID that they now think that a war is like going to maybe distract or make them look strong and powerful and, and make people forget what they've been put through over the last two years? I think also distracting from the fact that they've absolutely, with the White House, Senate and Congress, they have passed literally no legislation yeah. of note. Yeah. Like you were bringing up Russia earlier and... Russia has had access to medical care since 1993 for working people. We're trying to fight for that program that they've had. They have family leave for people that, you know, or maternity leave. We don't have that. In fact, our, our birth, you know, as, as far as like where we're equivalent to with medical and, and birth, you know, with, with mothers being able to maternity care and all that, we're equal to Bangladesh, according to a World Health Organization study. I mean, we are... The Americas, and I don't, again, this is where your, your system in England might be different than ours. We've, had, we've even privatized ambulances in some areas so that you can't have that covered with insurance. You would have to pay out of pocket. So going back to the corruption, instead of bribery, what we do is we privatize. So you privatize the jails and prisons. You privatize medical care. Yeah, yeah. Privatize the pharmaceuticals so that you know, when you go to get your diabetes medicine, um, so someone who has that, you know, horrific disease that needs that medicine, they're paying out, um, I think it was like a thousand times more than they were 10, 10 years ago. It's, it's, and so now they're trying to lower that, right? Um, so you, I mean, we have it, it's so, it's almost ingrained. So for the average working person, when you ask them about Russia, they're basically just going to give you the talking points they heard from CNN, MSNBC, and some uh, BBC, some of the major networks. They're not going to be able to have any kind of depth. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's a shame because if um, if the American workers understood like what the uh, the Russian workers were able to achieve, you know, it might sort of uh, encourage them to organize and, and fight for better better conditions right. provisions for themselves. Right. But I yeah, I mean, I think the American people are probably the most propagandized to people on earth um, without even knowing it, without even realizing. I mean, one thing I noticed when I've traveled around the U.S. is um, even just on TV, like pharmaceutical ads um, between like any ad break, which I don't think are legal in any other country on earth, but you just are bombarded with, you know, advertisements for like different medications. And, you know, it's just so like, so not normal to anyone from outside the US. But if you, if you're from the US, you wouldn't even know that it wasn't normal. Um, Cause right. it is normal there, but um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, 
just sort of finally, like, how do you see the situation in, in Ukraine sort of playing out over the next sort of coming weeks and months? Well, you know, this is where timeline is kind of good. And, and um, if you watched over the last couple of months build up to this, there was an extreme amount of Russophobia, right? Um, Anti-Russia propaganda. And then building up to this kind of hysterical is what the word. I mean, is. yeah, it's been going on since like November last year. I remember talking about it uh, in, in December. Um, it's been building for months, you know, imminent, it's imminent, it's going to happen. And Right. And like, for instance, um, I think there was a, a State Department um, like three weeks ago, they just gave a 33 page report about how RT and Sputnik are considered propaganda. And, um, you know, they're trying to lay the frame and Germany did try to shut it down the channel down. I think there's still a battle going on there. And, you know, they're trying <laughs> to shut down any opposing information, anyone with other views um, to close off and just make an echo chamber so that they can do their war and make their money. And I think that, you know, that's where citizens have to stand up and make sure we won't stand for that and, and that we want peace and we want, you know, good relations. I mean, think about, even with COVID, think about how wonderful it would have been instead of this villain kind of narrative, if we and Russia and China collaborated, right? Yeah. And collaborated in all kinds of ways. Um, what could be done instead of instead of you know war and and making it but i think what the what you're seeing is the death rattle of the western empire and i think the world is collectively looking east because they have a healthy and educated workforce and america and great britain are not allowing their workers to be healthy and to be educated and I mean, the East is far more sort of stable at the moment. Their economies are growing, their countries are developing, their people are, are younger and um, yeah, uh, working hard and, and really building up their countries. Whereas you feel like the, the West is just on the brink of sort of collapse and, and it's like the last days of Rome. Yeah, and that's not to say that those places aren't, don't have their own corruption and their own issues, right? Like, and, and own lack of infrastructure or problems. I, I'm not, I'm not trying to sugarcoat this. What I'm trying to no. say is that the narrative that's being shoved down our throats as Westerners is that, you know, these are not places to look to for innovation, creative, economic, forward movement. And, you know, uh, someone I like to follow who's really good is Claire Daly, and she, she gave a really great speech, and I'm trying to remember, I don't want to misquote her, but it was a few months ago, you can look it up, um, and she's an Irish MP, but she gave this wonderful speech about um, how the Russians have no negotiating ability with, with the West because we're not letting them negotiate in diplomatic ways, right, and we're not letting them come to the table, and I would go even a step further, there's no table, yeah. like they've taken it away. And we've just put them in this kind of catch-22 position. And so like what you were saying earlier, yeah. the narrative can be, oh, well, because of our, you know all our chest pounding and blustering, they blinked. No, maybe wanting peace is more sane. Maybe they're the more intelligent ones. Or the, <laughs> you know. Like, so, so, you know, it's, it's, we live in a world where many things are true at once. And as consumers of media, I think it's really important that we look at international, but also look at media in not what they're saying, yep. but who's funding what they're trying to say and why are they trying to say it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, everyone needs to be a lot more critical of, of what they hear on the media. Just, I mean, who's funding it, but also the simplified way that messages are presented uh, as if, you know, every issue is black and white and that there's a right and wrong, good and bad. It's like everything's so much more complex than that. Um, and the only way to really understand is through our own investigation and, and talking to as many different people and getting as many different viewpoints as possible. Um, absolutely. I 100% agree. Um, I think... Um, yeah, I mean, sorry, just to go back to sort of the situation in Ukraine, I don't want to harp on about it, but I mean, you no, know, no, I mean, we might be facing a world war. So yeah, I mean, do you, do you yeah. think it's going to come to that? 
I think the US wants it too. I don't know about Great Britain. It sounds like they're echoing the same rhetoric as the United States, unfortunately. Um, that speech I heard today was very, you know, the fact they're issuing sanctions, like as we're speaking, there's all kinds of this like fast movement. And, you know, yesterday, if you if you read the transcript of, of Vladimir Putin, um, the president of Russia, he, he knew the sanctions were coming no matter what they did. Yeah. So again, if you pull away the negotiating table, how can there be any diplomacy? I think that that Joe Biden is trying desperately to hold on to power and economic power. And so, you know, the cutoff of Nord Stream 2, they were really the only competitors, um, you know, with the US as far as fracking. But bear in mind, Nord Stream 2 is European also. It's not just Russian. I mean, this is, you know, there are lots of kind of elite battles happening behind the scenes that we don't know about. Lots of interests at play and they don't all sort of fall yeah. on one side or the other. But I do think that um, we're heading towards a precipice. How far they'll take us, I don't know. But I think I'd like to see some anti-war activists getting a little more vocal and a little more active because <laughs> just kind of sleepwalking. Are we gonna sleepwalk into World War Three? Are we gonna yeah. allow these people, you know, I, I mean, I mean, these mad bastards are gonna take us into war. Yeah. And that's what they're doing. Nuclear to war potentially, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, w I was talking uh, with someone about this yesterday, you know, just 20 years ago, uh, just before the, the Iraq war, you know, in London, there was a, a million people on the streets uh, protesting against it. I mean, they weren't successful, but um, now it's like there's not even barely a whimper, um, you know, and, and this could be so much more catastrophic. Um, yeah, not that I want to be sort of pessimistic about things, but um yeah, is there any any other sort of comments that you wanted to make to our audience? Um, I mean, we we're sort of mostly focused on what's going on here in Britain, but it's always good to hear about what's going on uh, across the Atlantic as well. And uh, obviously, the midterms are coming up in uh, November. Any other sort of major American political uh, crises happening that we should be aware of? Well, I think mainly it's it's just the the rhetoric of going to war. You have Anthony Blinken, who is the secretary, you know, and you have um, Michael Mafal and people like that. And you know, I know that there are other people behind the scenes doing diplomacy, but what is coming out um, right now is is you know is just pushing and pushing and pushing. And Great Britain is you know I heard today I heard your, your I'm talking and and I hope that you know for the working people I guess I would ask the working people of Great you know Great Britain of, of England what would a war in Ukraine do for you yeah what would it put food on your table I mean do you want your sons and daughters to die like in our country now women are going to war as well like so yeah. I don't know about Great Britain but you know I I just I uh it's very sobering and I feel like there's no grownups in the room. I, I don't feel them. And I, and actually the bad thing is because I did the work that I did and I know some of these people, <laughs> I know there's no grownups in yeah, the room. Yeah, that's the and worrying got, thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and, and you've got some people with some really heavy economic interest and at least a little bit of a war. But the problem is once you go into a military conflict, it's so unpredictable and so many people can die. So, um, you know, let's, let's hope for peace. And in the interim, I, I encourage people to like, look past, you know, the British past press, the American press, look at some of the Russian press, look at, talk to some Russian people about how they feel yeah. and make those connections. Because I think through friendship and love, our countries can, you know, communicate at a different level again. Yeah. My yeah well thank you so much again for joining us uh, hopefully we can speak to you again soon but um, I'm sure that the members and followers of our party will uh, enjoy what you've said uh, so thank you again and um, yeah all the best to you and enjoy your day thank you for having me take care much cheers